now who is learning from your answer. Because this is not an uncommon situation today. Uh, we encounter this kind of scenario all the time in our Ndoa class. Ndoa is our 10-week experience where we help couples uh, who are planning to get married or uh, we enrich the marriages of couples who are already married. And it's amazing how many times you find a situation like this. I mean, people who are married, they struggle with this issue all the time. In other words, what they're asking is, how much of my old self do I have to give up to stay married to this person? Many times people are asking, what is reasonable for my spouse to ask of me, and what is off limits? Many times people are asking, hmm, should my spouse even know how much I earn? Or even what I give to my parents? Is that my spouse's business? They look at me like you have the answer to that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, should we have a joint account? Or should we each pay our own bills, everybody minding their own business? Should I keep some secrets to myself? I mean, seriously, there has to be a limit to how much I let this person know. And the question we're really asking is when it comes to marriage, how much is too much? How much is too much? When somebody is asking for all this information, how much? is too much. And you know something? These are not easy questions. They're not easy questions. And I want to say that many couples struggle with those questions. In fact, I believe there are some couples in this house today who are struggling with this question. I told you, we're, we're doing sermons that are two for the price of one. Eh? So if you're married, hallelujah, you're going to be getting answers. You've been wondering about the answer to this question. In fact, I dare say there are some single people in this church who are still single today because you do not want to enter into that space where someone is negotiating on your way of life that you are used to and you don't want someone to change you from who you are. I don't want to do an altar call for that one. <laughs> but let me say this. Whether you're married or whether you're single, here's one thing that's interesting. Every single one of us, when it comes to a relationship with God, we struggle with the very same thing. Every single one of us. We want to love God. I mean, the reason we're here is because we, 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 like, we love God. At least maybe we like Him. Okay, at least you don't love, at least you like Him. That's why you're here, isn't it? You're here because you want to connect with Him. You're here because you want to have a relationship with Him. You're here because you want His blessings. And you want his favor, his hand of favor on your life. You're here because you want to connect with the purpose that he created you for. You're here for those reasons. But here's where the problem begins for us as Christians today. The questions we ask is, how do I get all these things in a way that works for me? What if I come to God and he asks me to give up something that I'm not ready to give up? What if serving God leaves me poor, leaves me looking weird, leaves me embarrassed? What if, in other words, when it comes to a relationship with God, we ask the same question, how much is too much? How much is too much? That's what we want to talk about today. For our visitors, my name is Moredi Wanjao, Pastor M is what they call me, and I'm so excited to be here sharing God's word with you. I'm the senior pastor of Mavuno Church, and we're delighted that you're joining us today. We've been going through an experience for the last 12 weeks called the Refresh Challenge, and what we're doing is just going through this 12-week experience that will, will, will inspire us. It's a, it's, it'll ignite our passion for God. It'll help us impact the world. That's what this Refresh Challenge really is about. And what it, it, it's happening primarily in our life groups, in our home groups, or in our small groups that are meeting here on Sundays. But in addition to that, every week we get a chance to discuss and to talk about the highlights of the things we're learning uh, that week. So that's what we're talking about uh, today. And that's what I want to ask. If, you're, if, you're, if you'd like to be part of this Refresh experience, uh, you're visiting today, or maybe you've been coming but you haven't yet had a chance to sign up, I want to say it's not too late. Uh, you can still go to our Mizizi desk. It's, there's a desk right outside, and you can get all the details you need. You can sign up. We want to start groups. As many people as are willing to be part of this Refresh Challenge, would love to invite you to be part of it. So let me just uh, say that little uh, commercial blub there uh, for our visitors. Also, one other commercial blub before I jump into, the, into God's word is 
Uh, we have an Easter choir that's already begun rehearsals. They're doing a phenomenal job. If you're interested in being part of that as well, uh, please sign up after this. And over Easter, we're going to have a really amazing treat uh, with, a, with a choir made up of congregation members, people who look... Does your neighbor look like they can sing? Just give them a look. I mean, do they look like they can croon some, some serious vocals? Uh, you don't have to be an expert singer to be part of this choir. You just have to love to make a joyful noise and to be part of, uh, part of a group of people who love to enjoy God together. So, so please sign up for this. We'd love to connect with you uh, right after this, this test. So anyway, back to my question. When it comes to serving God, when it comes to God's requests on us, how much is too much? There's a very interesting experience that Jesus went through with some people who wanted some of him. They wanted what he had, and they had to, he, he, he talked a little bit about this question of how much is too much. And the story is in John chapter 12. I want us to read it together. John chapter 12 from verse 20. John chapter 12 from verse 20. And it goes all the way, and I'm going to read all the way till around chapter 33. So John chapter 12, verse 20 to 33. And it's just a fascinating story. So, so here it is, Jesus is talking to some people, and then now this story breaks in. And it says, now there were some Greeks among those who went to worship at the festival. So Jesus is at the festival called the Passover festival. Happens in Jerusalem, capital city of Israel. Happens once a year, and people come from all over Israel and even other countries uh, to worship uh, God in his temple in Jerusalem. So there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, one of Jesus' disciples, from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Now, these guys are Greek. They go to Philip, who has a Greek name, and they probably figure this guy, will, he, at least he'll connect us. They want to see the big guy. They want to connect with him. And so they say, please, we want to see Jesus. We want to connect with Jesus. And Philip, he went to tell Andrew, another disciple, and then Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, speaking about himself. Very true, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I've glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd that was there heard it, and it said it had thund thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Father, I want to speak a blessing over your people as we come today to celebrate you to listen to your word, to learn from it, to grow from it. Lord, we thank you because these words, they're written, they're just words, they're written on a piece of paper in a, in a book that was written years ago. But in reality, Lord, they're the, they're, they're the word of God. And when your spirit comes and ignites those words, they become alive and they transform us and change us to be who you want us to be. And Lord, our prayer today is that as we hear this word, it will come into every one of our lives and you will transform us. Father, I know you have a great thing you want to do in our service today, and I'm inviting you to do exactly that. We're refusing any work of the enemy that would keep your people from hearing your word, that would keep them where they've been in their past, stuck in their past, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we declare freedom in this place. I declare that every one of us would leave this place not just informed, but transformed in Jesus' name. And so Lord, we bless you, and we thank you, and we love you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people say it. Amen. So our story begins with some Greek people who want to see Jesus. Now back in those days, Greece, Greece was no longer the, the, the political capital of the world. The, the Greeks no longer ruled the world. But everybody knew that the Greeks 
were the most sophisticated people in the whole world. Greece was the country of Alexander the Great. He had made it great. great. And even though they no longer ruled the world, their culture was everywhere. Everybody wanted to be like the Greeks. Everybody dressed in Greek clothes, spoke the Greek language. In fact, the interesting thing is most of the New Testament was actually written in the Greek language because that was a language that everybody, everybody in the world in that time, uh, people spoke in this language, everybody especially in that part of the world. And so these sophisticated people or these people from a sophisticated country, they're here to see Jesus. And you know, we don't know why they wanted to see him. There could have been many reasons why they wanted to see him. I mean, just a few weeks before, a few days before that, Jesus had come triumphantly, riding into Jerusalem, and the people of Jerusalem had declared him to be a king. And so maybe as these people saw Jesus, they were curious. They wanted to see, is this a real deal? Maybe this is why they came to see him. Or maybe they had heard about his miracles. Jesus had done some amazing miracles just before that, including raising a person from the dead. And maybe they wanted to see if this was a real thing and if they could even sign up to be part of his organization. Or maybe, as a sophisticated peop people, they wanted to add him to their networks. They had heard that this guy was trending. He was the guy everybody was talking about. And now they wanted to add him to their networks. If it was today, they'd have wanted to take a selfie and upload. You know how it is? It's like, you guys need to know people. Do you ever see that in your Facebook page? Like people just taking pictures with famous people. Sometimes you're not sure they are together. It could even be Photoshop. But anyway, these guys, they wanted to make sure everybody knew perhaps who they knew. But whatever reason, we're not told the reason, we're told these people went and they wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to connect with Jesus. Now the disciples, when they were approached, I suspect they were excited. You know, when they started following Jesus, nobody else was following Jesus. Nobody else knew who Jesus was, but somehow they believed in him before other people could see it. And now the world was beginning to see it. Just a, a day or two before, people had been cheering Jesus and saying, Hosanna. They're saying, this is a king who has come. And now people, other people, foreigners from sophisticated countries are coming to see Jesus. And I suspect they went and told Jesus, you would never believe who's asking to see us. <laughs> you know how it is when people are hanging on politicians and your MCA, the guy you're campaigning for now has become the boss. You know how it is? You're, you're next to power now. And I suspect these guys went to Jesus with that thing of, my goodness, we are in. Look who's coming to see us. And so what Jesus said to them next was the most shocking thing. It was the most surprising thing. It had nothing. It seemed to have nothing to do with what they had told them. Jesus spoke about a kernel or a seed. Now, he picked the most popular crop of those days. He picked a, a wheat seed. Today, I want to talk about a more popular crop in our part of the world, which is mango, isn't it? Mango is what we grow in this region, for all of you who are from other counties. Uh, this, is, this is our common crop. And he talked about a seed. And he said, you know a seed? For it to become everything it was meant to be, it cannot remain a seed. Something has to happen. It has to give up itself and its current form, and it has, in effect, to die. Now, it's very interesting because, you see, inside a seed, there's an embryo. Anybody remember that from biology class? Yeah? There's an embryo. There's a living, there's a living form. There's a reason why you learned those things, by the way. It was not just to cram and then leave the exam. <laughs> there's a living form. There's, there's an embryo inside there. And that embryo is surrounded by living matter. And the reason for that matter is to provide food and nutrient so that this embryo can produce the, the, the shoot that will go up towards the sun and the roots that will go down to collect all the nutrition the plant will need. But you know what happens? When this seed is thrown in the ground, all the externals, they have to be consumed. Everything changes. It stops being a beautiful... In fact, even if it's a fruit, all that fruit, it just goes into nu nutrition for the seed. And the seed gives itself up. It's consumed. And eventually it dies. It will no longer be a seed. Something else has to come up. When that seed is subsumed in the ground, it feels like it's lost. But something else begins to come up. New life begins to come up. And Jesus is saying there's no way a seed can live to its full potential unless it's willing to die. Unless it's willing to give up everything of its former self and to become something completely different. In other words, no seed can fulfill its potential by remaining the way it is. And here's what Jesus is saying. 
He's saying, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my follower, whether you're a Greek, whether you're famous, whether you're a sophisticated person, whoever you are, if you want to follow me, if you intend to live the fruitful and productive life that I created you for, then like this seed, you must surrender everything about yourself. You must surrender everything that you know about yourself. And you must give that up. Surrender control of your life completely. And allow me to make you what I created you to be. Unless you surrender everything to God's control, you will never achieve the purpose that your life was destined to be lived for. You know, it's interesting. At Mavuno Church, we talk about purpose all the time. I want to discover my purpose. I want to make a difference. I want to live for the thing that God created me for. And here's the thing that Jesus is saying. You will never discover that purpose unless, like this seed, you're willing to completely trust the one who made you, com completely surrender everything, and allow him to make you something completely different. And this is the greatest paradox of the Christian life. Unless you die to self, you will never truly live that's a paradox. Unless you die to self, you will never truly live. Now, somebody could argue, I mean, really, Jesus, are you being a bit extreme here? You're using very extreme language. You're using language that is a bit shocking. It's morbid. You know, the, the, the Jews were very much like Africans today. We don't like to talk about death. We don't like to mention that one day we might die. In fact, we think that when you say it, it might speed it up. Isn't it? So we don't talk about death. We don't mention death. It's, it's one of those things we're squeamish to talk about it. In fact, Africans, we don't write wills. I was going to say, raise your hand if you have a will. Don't raise it, because many of you are Africans. We don't write will. Even, if, even when we are sick, and we know our days are few, we just think, if I write the will, I'll die faster, isn't it? That's how, it's a major issue here. We don't like to deal with death. We don't like to think about it. We like to... In fact, one of my professors, when I studied theology, said he had, he had a book called The Denial of Death. And he said, for human beings, from the day they were born until the day they die, they, con they make their whole existence about this one thing, the denial of death. We, we, we live to pretend that we will never die. And it's a squeamish thing. It's something we don't like to talk about. But Jesus talks about death. He says, look, unless you're willing to die like this seed, you cannot be my disciple. You know, death is hard. Death is bloody, death is messy, death is, it's, it's just, it doesn't wait its turn, it's very ungently manly, ungentlemanly, it, it comes to everybody, it's very democratic, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're strong or weak, whether you're prepared or unprepared, it comes to every one of us, and there is no court of appeal, there's no mitigation, when your time comes, it comes. I had a little story about a guy who uh, was told, a rumor came and he, he confirmed it was true that he was supposed to, he had an appointment with death that day. And this guy was told that, you know, the, the, the death is coming to get you. Uh, and he decided, because he had been told death is coming to get you, he decided to do everything he could to run away from death. He got on a journey, he got, a, he got us some camels and he went across the desert as far as he could to another city. He left the city he was in, he went to a city called Samara. And he took a few days journey to make sure that when death came to look for him in his house, it would not find him. And finally he got Samara. And when he got off the camel, he found an old man and he began to have a conversation. And he said his name and the man was shocked. And he said, why are you so shocked at my name? And the man told him, I am death. And the reason I'm shocked is because I had an appointment with you at your home, but you've actually brought yourself to me. Here, here's what that is saying. You know, it comes to everybody. Whether you want it or you're prepared for it or not, your day will come. And many times we don't want to face this fact that it's so final. This week in our readings, we memorized a very interesting passage. One of Jesus' passages that are easy to say, but when you reflect about them, they're, they're very countercultural. They go against everything our culture teaches us to think about death. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. They're not even going to put it up on the screen because you've all memorized it. You guys are awesome. Uh, I could tell, I mean, you guys walked into this place and I could just tell the, the word of God was just flowing out of you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say it together. Are you ready? Galatians 2.20. Let's say it. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Come on, clap for your neighbor. Well done. Good job.
That was awesome. That was awesome. Some of you are looking like, don't clap for me. I didn't really get it. <laughs> I, I was mumbling the whole time. But well done. You know, there's a dangerous fallacy. There's a dangerous mistruth, a lie. And it's a lie that has been taught by the church. And it's widespread in this country. And it's a, it's a very dangerous lie. And I, 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 I take responsibility. I say as pastors, we, we teach this sometimes unwittingly, without even thinking. And here's the lie. The lie is that I can accept Christ and choose whether or not to surrender to him. I, I can accept Christ. I can come to Christ and he will bless me. And then it's a choice at that point. Do I surrender or do I not? Can I hold on to some things or can I not? And that we can say the salvation prayer. Many times preachers will lead you through the salvation prayer without talking about that. And, and, you, and you feel like I can get saved and still remain in control of my marriage. Still remain in control of my finances. Still remain in control of my children. Still remain in control of my choices. My life, my choice. And Jesus, we add Jesus onto that. But here's what Jesus is saying, and it's completely different from what is taught in many pulpits. He's saying that you cannot follow me unless you totally surrender to me. Your life comes under completely new management when you become a follower of Jesus. Dying. <laughs> that surrender that you give to Jesus is so total, it can only be equated with dying. And dying here talks about just total surrender. It means you bring all your dreams and your desires and your plans and your habits and your relationships and your family and your possessions. You bring them all to Jesus, everything you have, and you say, Lord, I surrender it now to you. It is now yours. It is now under your complete control. All that I am and all that I have, I give it to you. I trust that your plan for me is better than your plan for, my plan for myself. And wherever you tell me to go, I will go. And whatever you tell me to do, I will do. And in the process, Jesus is telling them this truth. That's exactly what he's telling them. Jesus is saying, unless you die, you will never truly live. Unless you die to self, you will never truly live. You know, it's so interesting. In marriage, we say the same vows. My wife reminds me once in a while that I say these words to her. All that I am, I give to you. And all that I have, I share with you within the love of God. Usually she reminds me when I'm holding on to something I don't want to give to her. And she says, no, 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 remember, you say those words yourself. Uh, and, and, and I have to remember, yes, it's true, I actually did say that. You know, I, I, sometimes I go to marriage now, to, to weddings nowadays, and I see all the young couples, and they're just saying those words with such dreamy romance. Just staring into each other, drinking in love. All that I am, I give to you. I'm like, do you realize what you're saying to that man? Those are strong words you're saying. That's a serious vow you're making. That's a covenant you're making, and that's a serious covenant. It's a covenant to death. You're giving everything. That's what you did when you got married. And that's what you do when you come to Jesus. You give everything away. That's how Jesus lived. We see this in this passage. He was facing his death. And he talks about it because Jesus must have had some desires. He was, he, Jesus was, was human. He lived on earth. He was an artisan, he was a carpenter, he was good at what he did. He must have had some ambitions, he must have had some desires. He did not want to die. But he asks in the passage we read, Lord, what shall I say? Shall I say my will be done? He says, no, 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 Father, your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. This is how Jesus lived. And this is what he's modeling to us today as his people. Jesus is saying, unless you die to self, you will never truly live but wait, what if I don't want to die? What if I just want to faint? <laughs> you know, it's like, like, Lord, I can just sleep a bit. <laughs> you know, this death thing is a bit scary. What if I don't really want to go all the way? What if I just want a bit and not everything? Jesus says to this man who wants some of him, he says in verse 25, the man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, you're cheating yourself that you're in control. Those things you're unwilling to die to. You know, as we feel, many of us, we feel out a life deed. And some of us who are afraid to sign it, Jesus is saying, you're lying to yourself that you, those things are actually yours. You're lying to yourself that you're actually in control. You're holding on to something that you don't even own 
in the first place, you're holding on to a lie. And he says you're holding on to a lie that will actually kill you. Because the only way to life is by letting go of your life. The only way to purpose is by letting go of control and letting God be the one in control. Unless you die to self, you will never truly live. There's a little clip that I found that's so interesting. It talks about us as human beings holding on and holding on and thinking, God, I can't give this to you. And it's a little video clip, and I just want to play that for you right now. Check this out. That's it. It's over. You know, when I watched that video, I was really shocked. It kind of leaves you with a shock, isn't it? It's like, this is what my life is leading to. I'm grabbing and I'm grabbing. In fact, it was so interesting because it made me remember just an illustration that somebody shared with me. Uh, I actually watched a preacher share this. And it's a very interesting illustration. I want to share it with you right now. So imagine that this life, this rope, this rope represents your life. You can see some wires are holding it. So let me untangle some of them. This rope represents your life. And it represents a timeline of your life. It's okay, Kevin, come and, come and help me untangle that. I don't want to drop all the mics. So imagine that this rope is your life. And the reason it's long is because that's it. You've got a long life. You're an eternal being. You're created for all eternity. This rope is your life. So it goes all along. And imagine that that end just goes on and on and on for eternity. So this rope is? It's your life. It's a timeline of your life. The red part is your time here on earth. All right? This is a time that you're created because God has given you time on earth. But you're not a, you're not a, a being bound by time. You're a, a being for eternity. That's what the Bible tells us. So this part is your life on earth. The interesting thing about us is how much we are concerned with making our lives comfortable for this part and how obsessed we are with this part. And so here we are. Thanks, guys. That's good. Here we are thinking, my goodness, if I could just get the job I want, if I could just get the car of my dreams, if I just could live in the house of my dreams, if I could only save and save and save, then I can be comfortable for, like over here. I mean, this part will be so exciting. And, and, and we're doing everything we can in life to make sure that we're living this part well. Good grief. What about this and this and this? and this, and this, and this, the rest of your life. You're so concerned with just this little part here, and you're spending everything holding on to this part here, not forgetting that the Bible tells us that the decisions we're making in this part are what determine what happens the rest of eternity and where we are in that space. And here we are holding on. I can't let go because I want this part to be comfortable. Isn't that ridiculous? Does not look really ridiculous? I mean, you look at that and you're probably thinking, who's so daft to think that? Tell your neighbor, who would be so foolish to do what the pastor is saying? Seriously. I mean, who would even think to do that? That is such a daft thing to do. Here's what Jesus is saying. My goodness, unless you're willing to die to self in this part here, unless you're willing to die to self, you will never truly live. You will never truly live. That is what Jesus is saying. 
You know, it's so interesting because this applies in marriage. I mean, you said, all I am, I give to you. You basically died to yourself when you got married. Those vows basically were your funeral. We never realized marriages are funerals as well because your old self cannot exist anymore. You are now two have become one. In other words, the things that existed before are gone. And now it's a new, a new being. And that new being has a new life. Remember I told you two for the price of one, isn't it? Some of you right now, maybe you're struggling with that phone. <laughs> or maybe it's other things that are not about that phone. But I suspect today that God is going to speak to us in our marriages, just as he's going to be speaking to us in our relationship with Jesus. How do we die to self? How do we die to self? How do we get to that place where we actually surrender fully to Jesus? When you came in, there was a slip of paper. There's something that you found on your seat. And it has a slip of paper on it. And on that slip of paper, you found a diagnostic. It's a, a, a three diagnostic sections. And I want to take us through what those sections mean. Because in those sections, it begins to answer this question. What does God want of me? What is God asking of my life? These are the three diagnostic questions. Now, if you need a pen to write, I actually want every one of us to write. This one we're not doing digitally. So if you have a pen, pull it out. If you need a pen, raise your hand up. Our ushers have some pens, and they'll distribute as many as they can. Uh, please just make sure you hand them, you hand them back uh, afterwards or leave it in your seat. So please, please pass your pen. Uh, put up your hand if you want a pen. Those are Mavuno Church pens or pen pencils. Do not take it to your house or to your office. Amen? Uh, it might burn a hole in your pocket. So, <laughs> but write with it. So just raise your hand up, uh, ushers, uh, and when they run out, we'll just share across uh, as much as we can. But let's make sure whoever needs to get something to write with, uh, quite a few hands in that direction can write. So we're going to just go through each section, and I'm going to just help you diagnose what are some of the things in your life. And we're, we're just going to be talking about some of the things we'd really struggle with if God asked us to give them up. Some of those things you'd say, God, I, <laughs> you know, this one you can get, but this one, uh-uh. This one, it will be hard for me to ever give up. We want to diagnose ourselves. Nobody's going to read your paper. So don't be afraid to actually be truthful with it. No, Pastor time isn't going to read it. Uh, nobody really cares what you're writing except yourself. So, so write, it, write, write it as honestly as possible. So uh, Rocky, I think there's some hands over there, some people in front of you. Awesome. So I think we're, we're doing well. Excellent. So just make sure everybody who needs one uh, gets one. I, I, I know uh, Pastor Milton, there's some people. Like, okay, great. That's awesome. So, are you ready? Okay, some people are the, on that end as well. Just make sure everybody gets, gets a pencil if they need it. Fantastic. There's quite a few people on that end of the building as well. So, okay. First section talks about dying to who I am. In other words, issues of my identity. My identity. When you become a follower of Jesus, you're under new management. That's what it means. The closest thing I can think of to it is joining the army. I don't know if you know this, when you join the army, you actually submit your national ID. You leave it at the door, and they give you a military ID. In other words, you're no longer the person you are. You now belong. <laughs> you're now a tool of the government of Kenya. When you join that military, they, they change everything about you. The first thing that goes is your hair. Get a haircut, because it's gone. You no longer have the right to determine your hairstyle. I mean, it's as basic as that. Uh, from that point, they, they give you a uniform. And you have a superior officer, you, are, you, you obey all the orders that are given to you. Now, you can never come to the army and say, you know what, guys, I love the army, I love this gun stuff. I mean, I love looking cool in the outfit, like any haircut, like any, you know, I've got like a haircut that I've always had, I want to keep my Brazilian. I mean, that one cannot work. Uh, you cannot join the army that way. You cannot join the army and say, you know what, uh, uh, you know, I like my jeans. I mean, I, look the, I like the swag of the top, I like the badges, but can I keep my jeans? You can't do that in the army. You wear what the army tells you to wear. You can't decide, I'm going to follow the officer, but you know, sometimes I don't like being told what to do, so allow me those times to choose what to, You can't do that in the army. You're either in or you're out. It's the same thing when you choose to follow Jesus. You're, it's like you're, you're, you're completely a different person. You're completely a different person. You're under new orders. You're in a new area, a new family, and you have a new king, a new leader. So I want us to diagnose. I want us to diagnose... What is the you that you would find difficult to surrender if God asked you today to surrender it? I want you to be, just be as honest. This is the one you're saying, I just want to be real God. Because I don't believe God, it's like he knows already. So we don't have to pretend. But it's also one of those things where we are Mavuno, we are a real church. 
So it's like, Lord, I love you. Lakini, there are some things if you ask me to surrender, I would struggle with this one. So for some of you, it's control. Let's put up a list up there. Some of you, it's control. The need to always be in control of how things turn out. It's like I need to know. When I'm doing something, I need to know how tomorrow will work. I need to know how this thing works out. Are you one of those people? Write it down. Write down if that's you. Some of you, it's pride. You find you struggle with putting others, uh, serving others. You, you put yourself above others. And you struggle with others. You're impatient with others. In a sense, you think of yourself as better than others. Write it down. It's shown in how you treat people. Write it down. For some of you, it's bitterness. The feeling that others have hurt you, they owe you. The unwillingness to let go of that. My dad hurt me. Somebody hurt me. I cannot let go of that. This is who I am now. Let that go. Write it down. For some of you, it's low self-esteem. The way you view yourself. It's like you never see yourself up a certain way. It's always, you, you always think the worst of yourself. And you know who I'm talking about. Just write it down if this is you. Some of you, it's a habit, an addiction. Some of you, it's to a substance. Some of you, it's to a lifestyle. This is what defines me. Some of you, it's to clubbing and a certain way of living, going out, whatever it is. Just write and just say, God, you know, I can follow you like any this one here. It's the one thing I don't negotiate. I would not like you to ask me for this one. Just write it down. Some of you, it's a suspicion of authority. You just don't trust people to tell you what to do. And there's some of you, by the way, when people start telling you what to do, you just clam down. Nobody talks to me that way. Write it down. Suspicion of authority. Some of you, it's your image. How you look to people is so important to you. Write that down. Some of you, it's your recreational activity. Clubbing, riding your cool bike, all those things that are important to you. You're like, Lord, you can ask me for anything, but don't touch this part. Write that down as well. And what you're saying is, these are the things I would struggle with. If God was to ask me, and maybe there are other things that are form your identity. I'm from a, I'm from a certain family. I'm from a certain part of the world. You know, just write down those things. The things that you're like, you know what, this thing is so important to me. Write that down. If God asked me to change this about myself, I'd hate that. Just write that down. So that's the first area. You know yourself. Just taking a moment to ask yourself, what is it about who I am that I would struggle or have struggled in the past to surrender or would be very difficult for me to surrender if God asked me for? Write that down. Second thing, second area of diagnostics, Dying to what I have or my possessions. That's the second column in the paper. Matthew 19, Jesus met a rich young ruler. This guy was such a cool guy. He loved God. He knew God's word. He had studied it. He had gotten the best teachers to teach him God's word. He came to Jesus said, I'm ready. I want to follow you. Jesus looked at him and he knew what was in his heart. And the Bible tells us Jesus loved him. And because he loved him, he told him, go and sell it all. And then come and follow me. Jesus knew that this guy was held by money. This young man was very sad, and he walked away. And his possessions kept him from eternity. His possessions trapped him from living his life of purpose. Are there possessions that you'd say, my goodness, if God asked me for this, I would struggle to give this up. For some of you, it's money. Maybe you have it, or maybe you don't have it yet, and you want to have it. And you're saying, God, if you call me to be poor, not to have money, I would struggle with that one. Let's be real. Write it down. You know, at this point, you're saying, God, I would, this one would be hard. If you are to ask me to live a lifestyle where I didn't have money, a lot of money, I would struggle. Write that down. For some of you, it's your career or your business. It's like, God, you can ask me for anything, but this business I have built. This career I have worked on. Please don't mess with my career. Write it down. Be like, this one would be hard for me. But some of you are not writing. It's because you, none of these things are issues for you, huh? I'm assuming, or oh, are you in shock? All of us have, all of us have areas. Just write. It's okay. I'm not going to read them. Trust me. And I'm not, not going to ask you to change answers with your neighbors. This is not a test. So just write it down. For some of you, maybe it's your possessions, your house, your car, your toys. Write that down. It's like that hard drive of mine that has all those movies over 10 years. Write it down. This one, I, this one, you know, if, if thieves came to my house, this is the one I would just hide. I'd, I'd fall over it. It's like, kill me, but don't touch this one. My stereo system. Whatever it is, write it down. Because that's important to you. Maybe it's not something you have right now. Maybe it's a dream and aspiration that you have. Write it down. Lord, my ambition to own this. My ambition to be this. Lord, if you call me away from this, I would struggle. I would struggle. Write it down. Area number three. 
Basically, what we're talking in two is, what do I have that I would struggle to surrender to God? The third diagnostic area, dying to who I have, my relationships. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 to 27, Jesus says, says a very radical, this is probably the most, one of the most radical statements that Jesus made. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that no relationship in our life can ever be as important as our relationship with our Father, with our God. There's no relationship that can even come close to competing. And my love for God must be so strong that compared to my love for God, my love for my wife almost feels like hate. In other words, if God asks me, stop this, leave this, I would leave, even if I love that. And this is what we see in the story of Abraham, isn't it? Abraham loved his son. He waited 100 years for this kid. He, he loved him with everything. And then God says, give up your son. And the Bible says, I mean, his heart must have been crushed. He must have been devastated. He must have said, God, you should have asked for anything else. But what do we see Abraham doing? We see him walking with his son determined to obey God because to Abraham everything came first and that's why the Bible calls Abraham a friend of God so let's diagnose get your pens out get ready for this one are there relationships that you would struggle to leave behind if God asked for them maybe it's your relationship with your wife or your husband your children just write those ones down God if you touch these ones I would this one you know what for me this would be a hard one I would not want I expect all the married people to be writing this one, by the way, because if you're not writing, your husband should be worried. You're saying, what? God, take him away. No, of course you'd struggle. So write it down. This one would be hard for me. Maybe it's a dating relationship. Somebody that you're dating right now, somebody special to you, write it down. You're saying, God, this one would be hard for me to let go of. Maybe it's your desire for marriage. You don't have the person yet, but you know you're going to find them. And you're like, Lord, if you call me to be single, this one would be too much to bear. And just be honest and write that down. My desire for a spouse, write that down as well. Maybe it's your attachment to your parents and to your siblings. This is what defines me, Lord. And this one I don't want to mess with. Just write it down. Write it down. Because here's what you're doing. You're saying, I'm being honest before God. These are the things I would struggle. I would really struggle if God asked me to give this. I want to ask you to just take a moment now. Go back over those three categories. And just begin to reflect on them. Ask God to show you. Is there something you're missing out? We're in God's presence in this place. And just write it down. You're saying, God, these ones would be hard for me to give up. Anything else on this list, Lord, you can have. (laughs) But these ones, these ones would be hard. These ones I would really struggle. I'm going to invite my pastors who are helping me to come and take position. Just step up into their positions. As we finish writing, we're coming to the end of our service. I'm just going to ask you, pastors, if you'd help me. We're going to take a moment and just worship God together. Make sure you write, exhaust that list. Anything that God is showing you, exhaust that list. Write it down. Write it down. Let me invite the worship team as well to come up to help us as we conclude. So here's what we're going to do. The Bible says I've been crucified with Christ. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That word crucified was really a word of death. In other words, I've died with Jesus. And what dying with Jesus means is I've completely surrendered my will to Jesus. Everything about me now belongs to him. When somebody looks at me, they don't see Moravi, they see Jesus. Because even the things that Moravi has, they're gifts of Jesus and they're for Jesus. It doesn't mean that God will, when when I surrender to Jesus, that God keeps me poor. That's not what it means. It just means that anything he gives me is no longer mine, but it's his. So here's what I'm going to do. Pastors, just a moment. I need to explain this first. Here's what we're going to do. I I want us to take a moment and do something that could seem very uncomfortable to us. Because none of us like to think about this, as we talked about in our culture. As I do it, I don't want to be insensitive. Because I recognize for some of us, the thought of death is a scary thought. Some of us are traumatized because of death. And so I want to say this, I want to do this as sensitively as possible. 
And my intention is not to bring trauma to anybody here. But what I do want is for every one of us to reflect on the gravity of what it means to follow Jesus. Because following Jesus calls for everything. It costs us who we are. Here's the amazing thing. Jesus once challenged me about this. I gave my life to Jesus. And I thought, you know what, I'm following Jesus, I'm really happy. And then I had somebody preach a sermon like the one I've preached today. And the person told us, you cannot be a follower of Jesus if you don't surrender everything that you have. And he told us, take a moment. In fact, that day it was a full day of prayer. Some of you heard me share this story. And they say, take a full day of prayer and just fast and pray and write down the things that you would struggle to give to God. And then take time to surrender those things to Jesus. And I remember thinking, well, okay, fine, I'll do it. But I thought, why a whole day? This should just take a few minutes. I mean, I, don't, I was young, I was broke, I had nothing. <laughs> but, I, but they said a day, so I thought, okay, let me go do it. If I finish in two hours, I'll take a walk and just spend the rest of the day, wait until they're ready. And I sat down and I began to list the things that were important to me. And I began to list them. And I began to list them. And I began to try and give them up. And I remember some, on that list was my career. My career was such an important part of who I was. It defined me from when I was young. And I'd studied for that career, I'd excelled in school in that career. And I was just about to go and do a master's in that career. And I remember saying to God, God, you want this one? If I surrender this to you, what if you take it away from me? And I remember it took me almost half an hour praying about that career. And eventually, I just, with tears, I crossed that out and I said, God, this career belongs to you, it's yours. And then I prayed about other things, my family. Now, that's very important to me, my parents. I wrote those down and I prayed about them. I prayed about my girlfriend. I was, in, I, I was dating that point and I finally found the girl I thought could, could work for me my whole life. And I loved this girl with everything. And I remember writing her name down and om, with tears, just writing that down and then crossing that out and saying, God, if you should choose to take her from me, she's yours. She's your gift to me. She's no longer mine. I'm not holding on to her. My hands are like this. And I remember it took me, I, I, I was crying by the time, I, by this point, I was just crying and crossing. And somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And they said, it's time for dinner. It was 6 p.m. I'd taken a whole day. I thought it would be something that would take me two, two hours. It took me a day. Because I realized just how attached I was to those things. But the most interesting thing I want to share this is that day I was a free man. I tell people, my life changed that day. Probably that's the day I really got saved. I was actually working in church at that point. Because before that, I followed Jesus on my terms. But from that day forward, I knew I was His completely. And I tell people, my life began that day. Because from that time on, Jesus began to tell me what I could own and what I could not own. First thing He told me is that career, you picked it for yourself. It's not my career for you. I want it back. And I gave it up. Never, by the way, I've never even regretted. I wanted to be a rich pharmacist. When I look at all you rich pharmacists who are in here, I don't even feel jealous. I'm happy for you. That's not my calling. I know mine. Mine was to be a pastor. And let me tell you what, I love what I do. This is what I was created for. I could do it for free. If you guys tell me you don't want to pay me anymore, it's okay. I will still do it. I love it. Why? Because it's what I was created for. But I could never have received my calling if my hands were like this. The next thing Jesus tapped me on the shoulder told me, marry that woman. I was 23. I'd planned to get married at 30 when I had some things settled. You know how guys like, you know how we like it, guys? He told me, marry that woman. I said, God, I don't have money. He said, marry her anyway. So I got married broke, flat broke. I think I'd worked for six months after my internship. The, the woman had no job. She got a job a month before our wedding. I mean, we got married broke. But let me tell you what, I'm so happy she married me and she saw my potential. Seriously, if I was broke right now and I lost everything, this woman would never leave me. We've been through it all together. God knew what I needed. He knows what you need much more than you know it. So here's what we want to do. We actually want to take a time, a moment to take a commitment of death. And what we're saying to God is, God, I choose as hard as this is, I want to make a commitment. I want to follow Jesus. And that means I want to put these things in front of you. I want to say you're more important to me than these things are. And I choose to willingly surrender. I'm not saying I choose to easily surrender. It's a difficult surrender. But Lord, I choose to willingly surrender. Pastor S, I don't know if there's something that God is saying to you.
Yeah, but first time before we, we do this, uh, this first time was uh, sharing. There are some things that came to, to my heart. And I sense there are some of us who maybe have not written this, but some of you who left a relationship a few years ago or months ago, and that relationship still defines you. Your boyfriend, the voice of your boyfriend. I think I saw this very clearly, Pastor M. Mm. And then I saw someone who lost a relative. It could be your dad or your mother or someone else. And that pain, the pain of that loss has defined you for a while. And you need to move on and let that go. And it's like that person has been the shadow has overshadowed you. And you just need to let go of that loss, yeah. that pain. Some of us who have held on to pain and let that define us. Uh, whatever kind of pain you've gone through, it could be someone who let you down, a boss who unfairly released you, whatever it is, but a pain that has defined who you are. And God is saying, that's not who you are, release that. Let that go. Yeah. Uh, and past time, I just kept remembering this phrase we said some years ago, dying is no joke. Yeah. For some of us, this is really hard to let go. But I just felt the Lord stand right in front of you and say, come to me. Beyond that death is me who is giving you life. Yeah. Where you feel like there's a lot of struggle. Some of you have not written some things because there's a lot of pushback from within you. Let go. Release yourself. Yeah. Dying is no joke, but there's life after death. Amen. As you Amen. release yourself to the Lord who is waiting to receive you, there's going to be freedom over your life. Amen. Let's do it for him. Bless the Lord. As Pastor S spoke, I also sense that somebody here, your parents' opinion is so important for you. It defines you. And your parents, even if God told you to do it and your parents said no, you wouldn't do it. And God is saying, I want you to write that down as one of those relationships you die to. And you begin to say, yes, I love you. Yes, I honor you. But Jesus comes first for me. Jesus comes first for me. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask what we have in front here are actually coffins. They're symbols of death. We don't usually have this in church, but today we do because we want to symbolize the importance of what God is calling us to do. So I'm going to ask our pastors to unveil those. And our pastors are standing next to each one of those. And here's what you're going to do. I want to challenge you to do this today. I want to challenge you to do something that is radical. Maybe you've already followed Jesus and you've not done this yet. Maybe you've just beginning that journey of what does it mean to follow Jesus. But I'm going to challenge every one of you to come with your piece of paper because I sense that God wants you to surrender today. He wants us to begin anew. We cannot be in the future if we're stuck in the past. We cannot be who he wants us to be if we will not let go of who we have been. And I sense that here's what God wants us to do. And I sense that I would want to invite you to do this. You will come up and you will do a viewing and in the viewing, you're seeing what you're leaving behind. There's no dead body in there. Let me just put you at ease. But you're coming to see what you're leaving behind. And when you're done, you will go to the foot of those, of those coffins. And in that basket held by one of your pastors who prays for you every week, you're going to drop that piece of paper. Please don't put your name on it. We don't need to know who you are. In fact, we're going to burn these pieces of paper. We're not going to read them. But this is your surrender before God, not to your pastors. This is you saying to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you. I want what you have, but I also want who you are and what you have for me. So I'm going to invite you as you finish, as you finish writing, some of you are still writing. Some of you, there are things you've left out you need to write. But I'm going to invite you as you finish, just come up to the front and then drop it down as we come to the end of our service. And then I'm going to bless us before we go. Just come up to the front. I'm inviting you now. Come. Come. Come and drop it down. Just line up next to each one. The pastors will direct you. Just make a line. Yeah. 
Give myself away. Give myself away. 
are still coming up, that's okay. If you haven't come up, there's still time for you to do that, so don't rush, but come up. But I'd like to conclude for us by praying. And I sense there's a couple of categories of people I'd like to pray for, and Pastor Simon is going to help me pray. There's some of us who... By the way, was that difficult? Yeah, that was a hard thing. Dying is not easy. But there's some of us I just sense that maybe... Maybe you thought you were following Jesus. Maybe you've grown up in faith. Maybe you've grown up in church. But today God is saying something. And you're realizing you've been living. I'm saved or I'm following Jesus. But you know my life has not been surrendered. It's not been surrendered to Jesus. And I want to pray for you. I bless God. I want to confirm what you've done today. But before I do that, I also sense there's some people here. You've never given your life to Jesus. You haven't yet trusted him with your life. And this exercise began to help you understand the real importance of following this king. And today you're saying, Pastor Em, I'd love for you to pray for me. Maybe you're even here and you once knew him and followed him. But today your heart is far from him. Maybe trauma happened, challenges came, problems came, and you are bitter at God. Maybe it was just a phase that you passed through and all of a sudden you realize I'm no longer in that life. But I sense that God is giving you an opportunity today to come back to him and to choose to follow him. And I'd love, I would love as your pastor to lead you in prayer for that. So if you're here, I'm gonna ask you to just raise your hand and put it down again. If you're here, you're saying, Pastor M, I would love to give my life to Jesus today. Either for the first time or I'm recommitting my life to him today. I want you to pray for me. I'm not even gonna ask people to close their eyes because this is not about anything to be embarrassed about. This is about you being man enough or woman enough to say, I'm gonna follow this king. I don't wanna be ashamed of him anymore. I'm going to give my life to him 100% and I'm going to follow him. And if this is you, just raise your hand up and put it down again. We'd love to celebrate you and I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, my sister. Let's appreciate her. God bless you. Anybody else? Thank you so much. I see you at the back as well. To God be the glory for you. Just raise it up. I see somebody at the back as well. To God be the glory for you. Amen. Come on, Mavuno, we can appreciate as these sons and daughters come back. I see a son on that end. I see a daughter on that end as well. Come on, let's appreciate all of them. Mabuno, we can do better than that. Bless God for you. Anybody else? Just raise it up real high. And say, Pastor M, pray for me today. Please pray for me because I want to give my life. I want to be serious. I want to follow this Jesus. For many years I've not done this. But I want to come back to him. I see you, my brother, as well. To God be the glory. I see you, my brother, as well. To God be the glory. Anybody else? I see you at the back, my sister. To God be the glory for you. Anybody else? Just raise it up real high. I see you at the back as well. To God be the glory. Oh my goodness, I see you as well. To God be the glory. Anybody else is saying, I want to follow this Jesus? Amen. Come on, let's appreciate them, all of them. Praise God for you. I want to bless God for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to do a daring thing now. I'm going to ask every one of you to stand to your feet. I'm going to ask you to stand exactly where you are and you're saying, you know what? I no longer live for my pride. I no longer live for what people think about me. This has nothing to do with my neighbor. Pastor, I am pray for me. I want to ask you to do that in public, in this family, in this congregation, because you're owning your father. You're saying, I belong to him from this day forward. Come on, stand to your feet wherever you are. Come on, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. This is you. Bless the Lord for you. Woo! Bless God for every one of you. Hey, listen, your reputation has nothing to do with this. Hey, what has he done for you? He's given you everything you are. How dare you say, look, I don't want people to know. This is not a private commitment you're making. It's a public commitment. You're saying, I choose to follow him. He's the biggest thing that could ever happen to me. So if you're still in your seat, stand up right now. Because you're saying, I choose to follow Jesus today. Come on, Mavula, let's appreciate them. Wherever they are, let's encourage them as they stand. Us, those who stand and the rest of us who are known Jesus to say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. From today, have your way in me. I give up sin and Satan and I release myself to my Savior and my Lord. I give up my past life and I receive a new life in Christ Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give it up to the Lord and just celebrate. If you're sitting next to any one of those, 
Just reach out a hand to them, say welcome to the family. Come on, let's just welcome them. Welcome to the family. Please have your seats. Come on, reach out to them, say welcome to the family. Let's affirm them in the decision they've made. We're so excited you're here. Let's appreciate them one more time. To God be the glory for you. Bless God. Bless God. We want to pray now for, hey, you've been here. My goodness, you've been living that life where, yes, I'm following Jesus. But, oh, my goodness, there's so much I've been holding on to. And you're saying I'm walking out of this place a new person. I'm following Jesus 100%. It's not 80-20. It's not 20-80. Lord, you're first and only in my life. And maybe some of you, you've given up some very significant things here. And I want to pray for you as we affirm what you've just done. Let me invite you to stand up to your feet. Stand up to your feet right now. Bless God. Bless God for everyone here. Everyone who's made that commitment. You've chosen to die. Some of you are remaking that commitment. You've already made it in the past, but today you are reaffirming that commitment. Stand up as well. You're saying, I, cho I chose to follow again. Because you know, the Bible tells us I die daily. It never gets easy. But every day I make that commitment, I choose to follow Jesus. Come on, just appreciate each other. Let's appreciate each other. We're following Jesus. We're walking after him. I'm going to invite Pastor S to just speak a blessing over us and whatever else the Lord tells him. Let me ask us to pray together. Would you just stretch your hands right in front of you as a sign of surrender, which we've done today. Lord, we thank you for what your word says. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny who he is. Lord, we come to you in surrender today as a community of believers. We say, Lord, we trust you. Yes, we fear to leave the familiar. But Lord, our trust in you is greater than our fear today. We fear what is going to happen on the other side of our commitment to death. But we know there's a God who resurrected Jesus from the dead. Lord, I want to bless your people today. That instead of fear, there will be faith. Amen. Instead of death, there will be life. Lord, in the areas where we fear, we have carried pain. May there be the joy of the Lord. I bless your people with a new walk, a new design, a new perspective, a new power to overcome everything that we are leaving behind us. Lord, I bless your people with faith that holds on to Jesus. Even when the things we died to today would try and resurrect in our lives. Lord, I bless your people with an endurance to live a life of faith in Christ Jesus. So Lord, as we walk in death to self and resurrection to Christ, may the power and the beauty that has kept Jesus out of the dead be ours right now. Lord, we pray that some of our relationships will be born again. Our marriages will be born again. Different things will be born again. Because we surrender to the only one who has got the power to bring to life what is important in us. Amen. So Lord, unto you that is able to keep us from uh, these things we have surrendered to. From uh, unto you who has got the power to walk with us in this new life. We surrender now and we say, take us forth to where you want us to go. So we declare today that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And we say together, amen. amen. On, you are blessed with a new life. Amen. Hey, let me say this. As you go out this week, you're no, you're no longer representing yourself. When the people in your office see you, they no longer see you jostling for your career. They see Jesus. And it's in your office, it's going to be like Jesus was there. In your family, it's going to be like Jesus was there. Tell your neighbor, go and represent. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>